Hello, um, and welcome to the Off The Track webinar. We're a couple of minutes early. I just thought that I would make sure everything's working. I think I've sort of finally sorted this out. I've got the chat and I've got everything going and I'm talking to to Rachel. Great question, Rachel. Um, and I think really that the more you teach your horse, so the more you interact with your horse, the better you know your horse and the better your horse knows you. So any little thing that you can teach your horse is going to build that relationship and that bond between the two of you. And you're going to get a much better understanding of your horse's emotional level, which is the big thing. Because if you're not feeling comfortable around your horse, what's probably happening is the emotional level of the horse is probably getting too high. So your horse is actually leaving that engagement zone, that bubble of communication that you're trying to create. And then that becomes quite frightening. So I'm just going to read your answer. I got a new horse at the beginning. It was simple, like lunging. He almost ran out of the round pen. Right. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. No, I think possibly, you know, your horse's history. And it's good that you've come to this webinar because we're talking about off the track horses. And with off the track horses, what we've got to do is completely retrain them because they don't know many useful things for us as pleasure riders. So it's a, just stick with me for, for this um, webinar because wh whatever breed your horse is and whatever its history, you're going to be going through the same process, which is basically untraining some things that your horse has learned and retraining what you want your horse to know. Now, if you've done something simple like lunging, um, which should be simple, I mean, we think, you know, horses should know how to lunge and your horse has actually taken fright at that and tried to run out of the round pen, then, you know, we've got to, we've got to step that back. And we've got to work out what it is the horse doesn't know, why the horse is reacting like that. And therefore, what we need to teach to get the horse to be more confident because we always, you know, we talk about our confidence and how, you know, we want to feel more comfortable around the horse. Of course, the horse has the same problem. And the only reason the horse is reacting like that is because the horse is not feeling confident and comfortable around us. So we need to sort of step back and say, right, now, how are we going to make this horse, get this horse to relax and start to learn, get that horse into that bubble of communication, into that um, engagement zone and start to teach that new horse things that we want it to know and so that's a, it's a great place to start with the um the off the track horses because that's exactly where they are um i'll just give you a little bit of history of my experience with off the track horses i grew up my father bred race horses now he knew nothing about horses he knew a lot about breeding but very little about the horse itself um but he did he had a number of racehorses and he raced them all and he bred from them afterwards and that sort of thing. I grew up with the, the sound of the racing commentary every weekend, you know, in the background. And um, on Sunday mornings, we used to go out in Sydney to visit the trainers and we'd go and visit. They'd, they'd bring the horses out and we'd look at the horses. And, you know, it is, of course, you know, where my love for horses began, I suppose. Then when I went off to boarding school, I went to a school where you could take a horse. It was pretty lucky of me. <laughs> and um, so my father gave me one of his failed race horses. Her name was O Jemima, her name was. And, you know, being young and naive, I just sort of thought, oh, great, you know, a horse is a horse, of course, of course, and um, jumped on this horse and assumed that it knew everything I wanted it to know. And being young, naive and incredibly brave, aren't we, when we're that young, um, all went really quite well considering that um, Ojemima really didn't know much at all. The only time I ran into a bit of trouble was um, playing polo cross on her for the first time and I had people on either side of me and I think she thought she was racing then, not that she was ever much of a racehorse but she did go pretty fast as I recall. And then when I left school I had to sell her so I, we ended up um, back at English Sale Yard in Sydney with this horse and um, I, I have I had the the idea that all these racehorses went off to beautiful lives as eventers and and this sort of thing. So I assumed that that was where she would go from the sales as well. Anyway, I remember um, I think I was um, I was off to do my final two years of school. So I was sort of sixteen, I suppose. Um, 
and I was getting her ready for the sale in the morning and I was riding around in a halter and no saddle and stuff. And I got caught by somebody who said, get off that horse, you can't ride around like that. Um, anyway, when she did go in for the sale, uh, the, the person who had caught me must have been Mr. Inglis, I think, because he the price wasn't very good. And then he said, hey, I saw this, I saw the young owner of this riding this horse around this morning with no bridle or saddle, and suddenly the price went up a little bit, and um, we did get a bit of money for her. But what I realised then, of course, was perhaps all these horses don't go off to having lovely lives as eventers after they race. Um, and and now, of course, you know, I know the truth and a lot of these horses have very bad lives indeed after racing. So that is why it's of particular interest to me. So I want to talk quickly about the reasons why these horses do often not have great uh, post-racing careers. And I think the first thing is probably their sort of perceived zero value. There, they breed so many racehorses in this country and, you know, in other countries as well um, every year and very few of them actually even make it to the race course. I think in Australia about one third of these horses that they breed, which is, you know, thousands, um, only one third make it to the race course. So the overbreeding is a huge problem because we start them so young, um, we they break down. So, you know, in this country, the two-year-old races are very, very common. And of course, it, it costs you a lot of money to keep the horse longer than that. So the longer you keep the horse before you start it, the more money it costs. So getting the horse to the two-year-old races is, um, you know, a great idea if you're an owner, not such a good idea if you're a horse, because of course, the bone, um, the growth plates don't close until horses are five. So racing them at two, you know, they are going to break down. Um, so anyway, by the time they finish racing, whether they're three-year-olds or 10-year-olds, unusual, um, their value has been very diminished. So they often end up at the sales. Um, some of them go to slaughter and others, of course, you know, are bought by people, but they are in the minority. They're very attractive to dealers, of course, because you can pick them up very cheaply if you're willing to pay, you know, $10, $20, $50 over the dog meat price then you can get yourself a horse which you know for a lot of dealers they turn them around or retrain them uh, in a matter of weeks and sell them on to somebody else um, they're also bought as project horses now whenever I hear the word project horse it just sort of cringe because to me it conjures up things like a horse that is disposable a horse that you can experiment with um, you know, if something goes horribly wrong, never mind, it's just a project horse, you can get another one. Um, and, you know, perhaps that's not everybody's view of it, but it, it does sort of make me cringe, the idea of a project horse. It doesn't sound to me like something that you're going to lavish your best care on, that's for sure. So then what happens after these horses end up with somebody like a dealer um, and this low cost of the horse means that they often end up with um, novice riders and owners so then of course what those novice people don't realize is that although the horse has been ridden it hasn't actually been trained for anything particularly useful for us as pleasure riders great for racing but it hasn't really learned anything much that's going to be useful for its post-racing career and so of course then they run into problems um and that means that the, the off the track's reputation gets even worse. So, you know, it's, it's a bit of a vicious cycle. These horses also, given their sort of their history and their breed, um, they often have um, special needs, you know, special veterinary needs. So they quite often have stereotypies like wind sucking and weaving and things. They're obviously, because of this, they're not the best doers. So they do often suffer welfare issues later on down the track. Um, so the big thing is how do we stop this this vicious cycle that these horses get into? Because the, the off the track horses are wonderfully versatile horses. They're very beautiful horses. And we're talking today about thoroughbreds. We'll talk another day about standard breds in particular. I just want to just stick to thoroughbreds today. And they really are so versatile. And we, we always say that about 
you know, any breed. But if you look at thoroughbreds, you can see them in every every discipline in um, every equestrian discipline, and they're they're wonderful horses. Um, but the way to stop the cycle is through education, and it's through education of the horse and the rider together. You know, we need to teach both the horse and the rider. Um, so first, let's look at what these what these horses know, what sort of education they've got when they come off the track. So they know they've been habituated to a number of things. So the saddle, the rider, those, those two things are really important. They've been habituated to wearing a saddle and to carrying a rider. Um, and so people look at that and they think, oh, the horse is broken in, the horse can be ridden, that's fine, they jump on and off they go. Um, this is not often, you know, as pretty as that might sound. Um, so why is that? Well, being habituated to wearing a saddle and carrying a rider isn't really enough for us. You know, that's, there's a huge hole in that training and that's all of that control that you actually need once you are riding. Because one of the big things with these horses is that they've actually been encouraged to exercise their flight instinct. So they've been encouraged to run, which is something as pleasure riders we really don't ever want the horse to do. And the more you practice doing something, the more likely the horse is to repeat it. So every time that horse has jumped out of the barrier and run fast, that's practicing that flight instinct. And so when you know when something happens that frightens the horse perhaps later in when we're riding as pleasure horses that is something that it's practiced a lot so that is a response that it may well come up with so what we need to do is work out what the horse does know and what the horse doesn't know and concentrate on what the horse doesn't know and filling in those gaps because there's not we can't change the past we can't change what the horse has already learned what we can do is we can offer the horse and teach the horse some more responses some responses that are easier for the horse to do and safer for us to experience okay so and we want to know what else the horse can do the horse usually knows how to load onto a truck because they do travel a lot, these horses, and they travel by truck, um, you'll find most of them haven't been on a float before. So that's something that we've, we've got to teach the horse. So what else don't they know? I think the big thing about these off-the-track horses is that they haven't really, I mean, there's exceptions, you know, to all of these things, and, you know, there are some starters that are really good and, you know, some trainers that are excellent, absolutely. But by and large, they haven't been taught so anything about pressure release. So most of their training, most of their um, handling really has been more about manipulating the horse and forcing it into doing things rather than explaining things to the horse. And you'll see this, you know, when you, you know, watch a horse, race horse in the saddling paddock and things or if you, if you find your horse's head shy when you're bridling it and, you know, what's probably happened is his ears probably been um, twitched when they put the bridle on or, you know, something has happened to that horse that, that means that it's afraid of that. So what we need to do is break everything down for the horse and re retrain that from the beginning. The biggest thing that's missing with these horses is an understanding of pressure release. So an understanding that there is a right answer and that answer is in movement and that the pressure will be released when you move in that direction. So let's um, just have a look. Rachel asked me a question earlier about, um, you know, how to get more comfortable around her horse and I suggested she just go out and start teaching it things. So this is, the bridling issue is a great one for these off-the-track horses because most of the off-the-track horses I've come across have been rather head shy and they haven't liked being bridled and that's probably because they've been muscled through the process so and it hasn't been very pleasant for them so it's a great place to start teaching the horse about pressure release because all you need to do is teach the horse firstly to put its head down now if the horse is very high 
has a very high head, then you can do that with the head collar and the lead rope by putting some pressure on the lead rope. And as soon as that ear drops, even a, even a centimetre, release it and praise the horse. Okay, so that's when we introduce that positive reinforcement and we, we pat the horse and we praise the horse for dropping its head. It sort of gets the horse thinking a little bit. So do it again, the horse's head will go up again. Put a little bit of pressure on, weigh, and as soon as that ear drops a little bit, release it and praise the horse. So all of this is building up to the horse, engaging his brain with us and thinking, oh, well, hang on a minute. The pressure gets released when I drop my head. And pretty soon that horse goes, oh, hey, that's, that's easy and I can do that and begins to anticipate that pressure. And so you go to, you, when you go to get the, um, to hold the lead rope, the horse goes, ah, ha, ha, I know what's going to happen and drops its head. And horses are great at learning patterns. So if we can have a really good pattern like that, these simple lessons, and everything is really simple if we break it down properly, the horse will learn that pattern and the horse will anticipate the pressure. It doesn't want the pressure, so it will drop its head before it feels that. And you'll find if you do this, if your timing is good, and by timing is good, I mean you release when, as soon as the horse moves in that direction you want it to go and the horse will pick up that pattern very quickly and you'll find you go to you go to um pick up pressure on the lead rope and the horse's head just drops and that's great because you've taught the first part of your bridling lesson there's other things the horse needs to know for bridling and we'll discuss those as we go along but what you've also done is you've taught the horse that there is a release of pressure and that's just the biggest thing with these horses is that pressure has become completely meaningless to them because it's there is never a release or if there is it's a random release of pressure and I want to show you what I mean by um, I'm going to just take you now bear with me into my training and I want to show you here we go I want to show you what I mean by that. So we've got an off-the-track course here. So we'll just go into view courses. Um, it's on the second page. Ah, here it is, off the track. Now watch this video we'll just open this up now this video was taken when I went to have a look at this horse we we're at the English sale yards this was actually where my horse from school was sold um, and my father used to buy horses here and this is a tried stock sale meaning these horses have raced and um, they're being sold as race horses or as pleasure horses or they end up at the doggers. This was actually a particularly beautiful horse, um, which I did end up on bidding on, didn't end up buying. He, I think he sold for $10,000 or something. This, guy, this fella told me he thought he'd go for two, but obviously someone was putting him back on the track. But I just want you to watch the handler's um, use of pressure on the bit. So the thing about pressure release is that every time you release, you should be releasing on a movement the horse makes that's correct so that the horse, you know, is more likely to perform that movement in the future. What you'll find with this is that it's really random. See, it's sort of jabbing on the horse um, all the time. So every time he releases that, it means you're right. Every time he picks up pressure, it means you're wrong. See, the horse, it doesn't mean anything because he's not releasing when the horse lowers his head. He's not releasing when the horse relaxes. He's, he's just jabbing on it um, really quite randomly. And so for the horse, the horse then just learns that it doesn't matter what I do. I'm just going to have this pressure 
on, on my mouth and it, it's going to come and go and, you know, um, I'm going to learn to ignore it. And that's what this habituation means. Habituation means learning really to ignore something that has been um, not, a, not a pleasant thing to go through. So this jabbing in the mouth that this horse is experiencing, he's learned to ignore it. So what happens when we then get these horses, we, we find that they ignore all these things that we need them to know. So they ignore um, bit pressure. And it does, it does make it, it makes them quite dangerous to ride until we've taught them about pressure release. So that's where we go first. With the, with the off the track horse, you know, we've got to first of all start to teach these horses about pressure release and so with everything we teach it's very important that we are um, teaching them good patterns now this is a horse that's um, just off the track and this is the owner so we thought well we'll just video how the bridle goes on the first time and then we'll and then we'll teach him this is fairly usual this is you know sort of quite normal behavior for an off the track horse um, and not a not a lot of fun. And you can see right there, you know, just the horse is quite willing to have a lot of pressure on his nose, on the head collar there. Quite um quite happy with that, quite happy to pull the owner around. Now he's just gonna walk around while she's trying to bridle him. And so, you know, if this is the horse's first experience of this, this is not much fun. For the horse and it's certainly not much fun for the owner um, and it is you know quite dangerous as well so the very first thing we need to do is to start to teach this horse about pressure release because we can then teach it everything it needs to know and what we want the horse to know is we want the horse to engage with learning we want the horse to understand that the pressure will go away we want the horse to understand that there's a right answer for everything. So, right there, right there. See, that was that was nice because what she did was she released when the horse's head came down. You know, I think somebody wrote to me uh, this morning about um, about my training, and he said um, he said, you know, what I like most about it is that you show the horse learning you know you show the mistakes he said i've looked at a lot of online training and it's they show it finished you know they show the finished result what i want to know is what happens you know when it goes wrong you know what happens when my horse walks off when i'm bridling it and i think what you need to do is you need to really concentrate on what the horse is doing not what the horse is doing right but what the horse isn't doing that you want it to do we can all see what the horse is doing we can all see the horse is walking off what is the horse not doing so the horse is not standing still so let's praise standing still rather than trying to correct walking off and once you start to do that once you start to really change your mindset around from looking at what the horse is doing to trying to work out what the horse isn't doing it actually changes your whole way of thinking about the horse around to a much more positive aspect. So what happens is we start praising the little things that the horse is doing. We start praising the horse for standing still. We start praising the horse for lowering its head. And we can really break it down then. So we need to remember, you know, you're looking at a horse that in the past – this, this would have been done. The rider would be on, the rider would be on, the horse would be gone. But, you know, this is this horse's new life. And so what we're saying to this horse is, hey, you've got a say in this. We're engaging you with learning. Um, and this doesn't need to be unpleasant. So what did that took? Two minutes. And that bridling was a much nicer experience for the horse. 
And so just by breaking it down that little bit for the horse, we're able to engage him in learning. And the horse is going to leave this bridling lesson and think, oh, you know, actually that wasn't so bad. I didn't get hurt. It wasn't confusing. And you can see this horse's attention is still elsewhere. Yeah, He's, he's not yet in my bubble of communication. And that's, you know, that's the thing with these horses is they've never, they've never been engaged with learning. So that's the big thing is to get them into your bubble of communication, get them into the engagement zone where the horse understands that the horse itself controls the release of pressure. And we've got to get the horses actually thinking, you know, okay, I feel pressure, firstly, because they've learned to ignore the pressure. They've been habituated to so much pressure. So we've got to get them thinking, I feel pressure. Then we've got to get the horse thinking, okay, now I need to find a way to release that. Now, in the past, it's been movement. Right here, it's the way to release the pressure on the pole, which is just my hand resting on the pole is to move your head down. So that's worked before for the horse. So he'll find that, he'll move his head down. And each time we teach something new, the horse is going to find a different way to get a release of that pressure. Um, and the horse builds up a bit of a shopping list of things, you know, so, okay, I'll drop my head, we'll see if that works, we'll do this, we'll see if that works. And with each new thing that the horse gets right, we release the pressure and the horse goes, oh, okay, so that pressure, maybe putting your my thumb in his mouth just here means open my mouth and the thumb goes away. And with that pressure, the horse works out that, oh, that just means open my mouth. And he's a horse that this guy hasn't had the um, bridling lesson yet. But for this video, I think we're using this horse for give to the bit. So once we've got the bridle on, then the most important lesson for these horses is the very first one we teach, which is give to the bit. Now, the reason I've got this whole separate module here for the thoroughbred is that they've been desensitized to pressure cues because they've, you know, if you watch these horses racing, you'll see that the jockeys hold a huge amount of pressure in their mouth when they're racing. And then when they stop, when they want to stop them, they pick up more pressure to try and get them to stop. But these horses, you know, really don't have brakes. They, <laughs> they stop eventually, um, probably when their mates stop. But, you know, they, they really don't understand pressure release. So the, the bridle doesn't mean much to them at all. This is this horse's first time in the arena and it's going to be his first give to the bit lesson. Um, and as you can see, you know, his emotional level is really high. So if we're judging emotional level out of 100, he's a good 75 right now. Now, what we need to do is bring him down to a 65 probably. And, um, and this is the best way that I've found to do that, which is simple pressure release exercise, getting him to respond to a little bit of um, bridal pressure and moving his head laterally, just slightly to the side. Now you'll find, I don't want him going backwards because I don't want him sort of um, moving away from the pressure in that way. I want him moving into the pressure by moving his head to the side. Now I've got a dressage whip with me because I don't want him to walk backwards. So that's the only reason I have it. Um, uh, this horse in particular, he when he came to me, they they said to me, oh, you know, he's impossible to lead. You know, he's really strong. He'll pull you all over the place. So make sure you've got a rearing bit in his mouth every time you take him somewhere. And this is, you know, his first lesson. So I don't have a rearing bit in his mouth. I've got a snaffle in his mouth. Um, he's, I think he's 10 now. He was gelded as a six-year-old or eight-year-old. Maybe he's an eight-year-old. Um, he raced and then he injured himself and they put him to start. Uh, he couldn't compete with the uh, better horses. So they then tried to put him back to racing and he broke down and then he came to me. So 
you know, he's had a he's had an interesting sort of career and horses that have been around the block like this bloke and also especially bean stallions, they've been really desensitized, um, especially to bit pressure. So and they sort of live on adrenaline a bit, these horses. So it was really nice to see this horse settle down um, and to see during this short lesson how he really did start to get into that bubble of communication. But I think it's quite interesting for you to see, you know, if you've gotten off the track yourself, to, for you to see how this, how these lessons start. Because people often ask me how much pressure how much pressure do I need to get the horse to give to the bit? And my answer to that is it's up to the horse. So here's a horse that's probably, you know, been used to having 20, 30 newtons of pressure, meaning 30 kilograms of pressure um, and being completely meaningless. So here's a horse that's been habituated or desensitized to a lot of pressure. And what I'm asking the horse to do is to respond to a small amount of pressure. So let's say the horse has been well desensitized to 10 newtons of pressure. The first time I pick up the rein and I pick up nine newtons of pressure, let's say, and the horse doesn't respond, then I'm just further desensitizing the horse to that amount of pressure. If the horse, if I pick up 10 and a half newtons of pressure and the horse responds and I release it, then I'm teaching the horse a new pattern. So then the horse goes, oh, hang on a minute, that went away, right there, right there. Okay, so this is what I want. I don't want to pull the horse's head around. I just want to put some pressure on and I'm going to release it as soon as the horse moves into that pressure. So I'm going to put some pressure on as soon as the horse moves its head slightly to the side like that and then I'll release it and tell him he's brilliant. So I keep repeating this same thing and what happens is the horse learns the pattern. The horse doesn't want me to put pressure on his mouth so the horse learns that um, the pressure is coming and starts to respond before that happens and so while I might have to start with 10 newtons of pressure by the time I've picked it up six or seven times, I'm down to one newton of pressure. And then, you know, it goes from there. It gets less and less and less. And for the horse, the horse starts to realise that it's the horse that's in control of how much pressure. So there's no point in my putting on so little pressure that the horse isn't going to respond because the pressure is my motivator for the horse to change so if my motivator isn't motivating enough to get a change, then I'm not actually teaching the horse anything. And I know, you know, a lot of people who who like to have really light hands, uh, you know, I never put any pressure on. But that's okay as long as you're not trying to teach the horse something with pressure. The whole point of this sort of training is that we're always, always aiming to be lighter. We're always aiming to use less pressure. So it's always the next time I pick up that rein, the next time I use the whip, or the next time I put my leg on the horse, I should have to use less pressure than I used this time. And if that's our aim, then we're actually training the horse to be light and to be in self-carriage. And these are the really, really important things with training. But you can't start with your goal. You can't walk out and say, right, I want to build a really light horse that's in self-carriage. I want a horse to be round and soft and in frame in the walk, trot and canter. And I don't want to have pressure on its mouth all the time. I don't want to wrap my legs around it and squeeze it all the time. You can teach that. And that's, that's easy to teach, but you can't start there. You can't go out and expect your horse to... Uh, maintain that posture and be in self-carriage um, unless you teach it to do so. So what you have to do is you have to release the pressure when you get the response you want. Now what's interesting about this lesson is the photography no, about this lesson is that can you see the horse with this simple lesson, his head's come down, 
and he's now now I'm starting to form that bubble of communication with this horse now he's starting to engage in the lesson now he's starting to get into that engagement zone the thing I like about the idea of the bubble of communication is that I can sort of see a bubble around this horse when he goes round and soft and he relaxes he's we are inside that bubble together as soon as he gets nervous and his head goes up he bursts that bubble and you can sort of see him doing that with his ears and quite often those pricked ears that go up and look at something else and I think about it like that when I'm riding as well you know think about this horse being in my bubble now, this is interesting too I'm on his right side now and these horses they, they rarely have anybody on their right. So you'll probably find when you begin your work that this is quite challenging for the horse, having me over here and asking him to walk around me. And you'll see he's finding it quite difficult. His attention is um, much poorer than it was on the other side. He's not sure how to behave. He's not, he's not sure that walking around me is a good plan. You know, he's much more hesitant on this side. So it's important that you change sides often so that the horse, you know, can get the experience and you go back to the other side and he goes, oh, okay, I can relax more over here. This is easy. Then you go back to the right side and he goes, oh, okay, I get it. But what, what you'll find, what I often find with these off the tracks is they've had so much handling on their left that they're actually very desensitized to pressure on the left. And they're actually, after the first sort of week or so, I find that they're much better on the right because they've been less desensitized to pressure and so they're more of a blank canvas on the right. So that's really where I always start with these horses, this very important give to the bit lesson. Once they've got a good understanding of that, we'll just have a quick uh, The preparation for long lining and the actual long long lining of the horse now you know these horses haven't been taught to to travel in frame at all and unlike the standard bred horses they also haven't had a lot of gear on them so the standard bred horses you know habituating a horse to the long reins for the standard bred is quite a different deal to these guys so it's important that we get this right for these horses um, long before we ever attach anything to them. And so this lesson here will just take you through how to do that. And we're doing that with um, Hercules here. And, and then, of course, you know, how to do your first lesson of long reining. And it's, it's great. These lessons are really good for these off-the-track horses because they don't have to worry about our weight. So what we can do is we can teach the transitions and we can teach the horse about self-carriage and we can teach the horse about the posture. We can also release the rein. And you'll see, you know, right now he's, you know, he's more relaxed, his head's quite low, and we're just going to work on some transitions. And we can do all of this with the horse before we ride. And, you know, we can teach it the verbal cues, the walk, trot and canter, all before we get on and it makes it makes it so much easier for the horse when we actually do get on so you'll see there that there's the, that preparation for long reining and then we go through the long reining process i just want to take you quickly through the rest of the course um and this is a this is another really important lesson for these off the track horses a lot of these horses, and if you want to paddock, the board quite often with the horse still walking or trotting around, you know, they just throw them on a board, and it's probably not a great experience for the horse. So, I think it's really important that we teach them this lesson. You can see, um, Lamekins, we call this, this boy, um, he's quite nervous about this lesson. So, again, it's another, it's a great simple lesson to teach and it's a very good indication of where your horse is 
emotionally. So it's a really good indication of whether your horse is is nervous or not. And, and Lamekins is showing us that he is. So what I've done is I've said, okay, well, we won't teach hips to the fence straight away. What we'll do first is we'll just walk you down the fence. And, you know, we'll get you, we'll get you used to the idea that standing next to the fence is, is okay. And that brings his emotional level down and keep him walking forward. That's really important too. So I'm not going to start the lesson until the horse is ready to start the lesson. And again, you know, it's really important that you, you see these sorts of things, I think, in training. The, the thing about online training is that if you don't see the mistakes, if you don't see the horses not doing it perfectly, then you're going to get out there and you're going to try it with your horse and your horse is going to do something different you're going to say, oh, I've done it wrong, because that's what we all do, don't we? We say, oh, I've done it wrong, you know. Um, well, you know, every horse is different. You can use the same technique for every horse, but every horse is going to respond just a bit differently. And I, what I like about Lammy here is that you can, you can really see his emotional level. He's like, oh, I don't like it. I don't know what to do. I'm going to kick out a little bit. I'm going to switch my tail around. Um, but He's, he's making that movement. So what we need to do here is we need to remember what our aim is. Now, our aim is to connect the whip or just lifting our hand and pointing at the hindquarters to having the hindquarters move to the left. When the hindquarters, we praise the horse and we release the pressure, okay? So we use that positive reinforcement of praising the horse and we release the pressure. And what the horse then learns is that it didn't die, you know, nothing bad happened, didn't get hurt, moved its hindquarters to the left, and we praised it. And you can see the horse settling down with that. It is more difficult, I think, with these off-the-track horses because they haven't had these good patterns set up. So every time you put these horses under pressure for the first time, they go, oh, I don't know what to do, I don't know how to deal with that. Um, and then they relax and they start to think about it and they start to look for answers. So if your release is good, these horses respond amazingly well because they go, oh, wow, you know, there is a release of pressure. You know, I'm involved in this as well. Um, and look at Lammy, you know, we're three minutes in and um, uh, he just, I asked him too much then, okay. So you'll notice that I'm really barely having to use the whip at all i just not even a tap anymore it's just pointing the whip at his hindquarters so he's really connecting the whip to his moving his hindquarters to the left so we'll just fast forward this and see how he gets on Then we're going to take it from just moving around um, around me to when we have to actually teach him that he could move around <laughs> when I'm up on the fence or the mounting block. And this is unusual for these horses. You know, they, they don't get a lot of time to just stand. I like this lesson for all horses, but particularly for these horses, because this hasn't been a big thing for them, you know, just being able to stand and relax, and that's all I want him to do. I'm not going to jump on. I'm not going to do anything for this lesson. I'm just going to get him to stand and relax, and that's, that's perfect, and that's a great first step for the horse. You know, nothing happened. It was all good. I just got to stand and relax. We're just going to go back. Okay, and then we, we go on to, you know, your first and second ride and riding the horse in the arena. So if you're working your horse through these off-the-track lessons, what I would do is I advise you to go to the off-the-track module first and watch those and then come back and just work through the lessons um, 
as you would in the order they appear. So you know, work through the engagement zone just to get an idea of your horse's emotional level. But then start with the give to the bit work because that's what you're going to be doing. And the this lesson here, this module here, really breaks that down. But you'll have that extra information from the um, the off the track module to help you as well. Um, but do work your horse through these lessons as they appear um, in the courses. So from the give to the bit, then we, we go to the shoulder control and there's the hips to the fence lesson. So, you know, I would even do the first saddling because I think that these horses, while they've been habituated to saddles, they still haven't been taught really much about the saddle at all. And you'll find a lot of them are quite cold-backed, you know, what we call cold-backed, which is really just a misunderstanding. They just really don't understand the saddle. So I think this is a great lesson um, for your off-the-track horse. I'm just going to have a quick look because on the second page here, oh, no, we've got the saddle fitting section there. But you'll find some advanced saddle habituation work here, which is actually fabulous for the off-the-track horse as well. So it's, it's important that you work through this carefully. And it's I often call it the recycling lesson. We teach the horse to, um, to long rank carrying this recycling, which bumps around, which again, you know, is something horses, off-the-track horses, have never experienced things like this. But it has to be done very carefully because the last thing you want is that you're off the track horse ever exercising its flight instinct again. You know, we really don't want the horse to be running away from anything because horses will repeat what they practice. So I'm going back here. Um, right, there we are. Um, just going to stop that, close that. There we are, my technology. Um, good. So that is it from me for today. Um, I think the important thing and the takeaway message here is to treat these horses like blank canvases. I mean, whenever I get an off the track horse, I assume it knows nothing. And I take it right back to the beginning and start again with it. We do, we, it's really easy to assume that the horses are broken in, that the horses have all this knowledge, but it's much better for the horse and much more fair on the horse to assume that it knows nothing. And you build your relationship with that horse together by training it, by training it yourself, which is the important thing. You know, it really is the important thing that you train your horse yourself so that you guys build that bond, you build that bubble of communication together. Um, and if something goes wrong in the future, you know what? Because you know how to fix something when it does go wrong. And I think that's so important. Um, anyway, thank you for joining me today. And um, I hope to see you next week. But go and register. Um, it's on my website. And just look up the webinars page on canduequine.com. Click on the webinars and you can register for next week's or you can watch um, any of the, the replays as well. Anyway, I will see you next Monday, or I will see you this afternoon, of course, on Facebook Live. I'm on Facebook Live every weekday at 2 o'clock. Bye.